Today, before I, I start, I thought, or after I start, I thought I should share someone else's notes on the Diamantina. Uh, it's a little verse uh, written by Colleen McLaughlin from Burnside at Springshore. And uh, I think uh, she might tell the story of the Diamantina a bit, uh, better than me. I'm swinging to the northward. I'm curving to the south. I'm spreading, I'm splitting, running free. I'm creeping past the sand hills, going steady as the land fills, for all my channels lie ahead of me. Through the grasslands and the mulga, past the rocks eroded bare, I will cover up the secrets buried deep. For if man thinks he can beat me, I will tell him come and meet me, but the signs to show the way are mine to keep. Because I'm Diamantina, and I rule the great outback, it's my heartbeat, I'm its keeper, it's my land. With my channels full and flowing, and the grasses green and growing, I'm the power that man must learn to understand. I will take your heart and hold it, I will commandeer your soul. If you listen to my voice and stand up tall, if your he ears can hear me singing, and your answer comes back ringing, then I'll know you have recognized my call. For this is my direction as the sovereign of this land. You must learn to read the rhythm of its ways. If you want to know it and share it, do not take its heart and tear it. For I'll tell you now, the loser always pays. Listen hard, I'm Diamantina and the sand hills and the plains need my water as their lifeblood. It's my land. Should my channels cease their flowing, then with dry, dusty winds blowing, I will know you have not learnt to understand. That's by Colin McLaughlin in 2006. So that gives you a bit of an idea and an appreciation of perhaps what people from outside this region think about the river. I'll give you my little episode, epistle now. Uh, and we're here all today because we, we care for the land. Uh, the Lake Eyre Basin, and in particular the Channel Country River systems, which uniquely drain inland to Lake Eyre in South Australia, are the subject of our attention today. These rivers, with their expanding floodplains and adjoining fertile land, have long been home to indigenous families, outback settlements, towns, and a highly, in highly respected cattle and sheep production industry. In total, the Lake Eyre Basin covers a sixth of Australia, and in Queensland we have three major draining uh, drainage basins. Uh, from the west to the east we have the Georgina, the Burke and the Hamilton joining below Bullia to become Air Creek, then the Diamantina which flows past my hometown at Birdsville and then the Thompson and the Barku which join above the above Windora to become the Cooper. Uh, in, in 2006 the, the far western channel country was in the middle of one of the worst droughts in the last hundred years. Uh, during March, Cyclone Larry crossed the coast at Innisfail, uh, dropping large amounts of rain and doing a lot of damage on the coast. Cyclone La Larry dropped rain across the northern part, <coughs> um, sorry, uh, across the northern part of Australia, just crossing the Georgina catchment. There was no rain south of Urundangi, but eventually this mighty river made uh, its way slowly down the system. This water gave much reader needed relief to all the cattle properties and to small towns from Camel Wheel to Adria Downs, a distance of about 600 kilometres. If this river system had been tampered with in any way, this wouldn't have happened. That water reached our property Adria Downs in the middle of May and stopped running into Mancuni Lake in early September. Still another 100 k to go, but it never got there to South Australia and it certainly never got to all the properties further down, uh, you know, further down on the way to Lake Eyre. So, uh, if there'd been a little bit of water t taken out, what people would call a little bit upstream, we wouldn't have probably got it. Uh, Lake Moncuni wouldn't have got it, and we'd have been all worse off. So that's a, that's a, actually a, a, a real story of what happened in that particular year. Uh, all, flow at, all these rivers flow at regular intervals into Lake Eyre. A feature of these rivers is that they broaden and flow more slowly as they travel south. Uh, allowing nutrients to be deposited on the giant floodplains. A very famous Australian, Sidney Kidman, 
recognised this and established a chain of cattle stations along the mid to lower reaches of these rivers where the floodplains are most fertile. Uh, my family and many others have followed our pastoral pursuits much later in the footsteps of Kidman. Uh, the basin, as we know, has sustained an indigenous population for thousands of years. Following on then the tentative steps of explorers, European explorers, came the small settlements and livestock grazing. Access, grades, access roads were opened up and visitors sl came slowly at first to experience the outback as explorers themselves. Resource exploration has now gathered momentum and is possibly our largest con contributor to economic wealth. Uh, I thought we might dream for a while now. Um, Sydney, Sydney's up there, there's rocks there. Sydney is justifiably proud of its lovely harbour and magnificent bridge which features every New Year's Eve on television screens around the world. Any proposal, if it were possible, to drain the harbour would cause an uproar. <laughs> would be bad for tourism, fishing wouldn't be any good, detrimental to the ferries so popular and necessary. The damage to Sydney's economy would be immeasurable. In the Northern Territory, the rock is a great draw card to that part of Australia. Mining the rock to recover valuable sandstone is not a prospect that Territorians would consider. Damage to the Northern Territory would again be immeasurable. So getting back to Sydney, and after the uproar following the talk of draining the harbour, there's a new proposal going around to only half fill the harbour so that it would allow space for the construction of a lot of waterfront homes around the edge. In the, de in the Territory debate is continuing on how much sandstone could be removed from the rock and still it's allow its, its value to be maintained. So anyway, back to reality. Uh, the value that we hold for the Lake Air Basin is a little more discreet. Being a very large area, I can think of a range of values respected and exploited by people for generations. Besides the great rivers uniquely flowing inland towards Lake Air, there are deserts overlying the huge uh, fresh uh, Great Artesian, freshwater Great Artesian Basin, oil and glass, gas exploration opportunities, and bush tracks and blue skies that draw so many visitors to this part of the world. The wise use of these resources is important if we are to continue to sharing the benefits of this special environment. We can take our time in wise use planning. There are no huge populations in the Lake Air Basin demanding uh, massive developments for us to, today or immediately. So there should be no rush to overexploit the values that are special to all of us. But back to wise use, what is wise use? Is it measured in money or sustainability? Resources are generally extracted over a short period of time, can be of high value and moved from one location to another. Our livestock production, which is my game, is tasked to operate at a level governed by seasonal conditions so that it can be sustainable long into the future. Uh, visitation, focusing on the bird life desired by many Australians and increasingly by overseas visitors is the lifeblood of many towns and obviously the whole area. Turning now to the closer focus of this conference, government regulation uh, to protect the values of the river system known in this part of the world as the Channel Country Rivers. It is critical that they be allowed to flow intermittently as they do at their full capacity. Scientifically generated uh, water allocation plans have been developed and should not be tampered with. Downstream habitats and habitats and values cannot survive future usage infinitum if we take, divert, block, diminish or corrupt the free flowing nature and the quality of our rivers. This ethic has allowed a clean and green livestock industry to prosper in one of the drier parts of Australia and has spawned a tourism industry growing rapidly with improved access and in particular at times when the great rivers flow to Lake Eyre bringing unimaginable bird life and publicity to the wider region. I've been asked to say a little bit about the clean and green industry in the basin. Now this tagline can apply to livestock, to resource extraction, tourism, towns and council activities. All of those can be clean and green. I see the opportunity given to all players in the basin as having a clean sheet to start with. It hasn't been messed up. If we're careful we can keep it that way. 
My particular focus has been on the high quality identi identity for the cattle production in the region. Now here's now a little of the OB organic story. In the early 1990s, the then Prime Minister Paul Keating declared the intention of the Labor government to nominate the Lake Eyre Basin in South Australia for World Heritage Listing. Many of you in the room today will remember that period of intense political lobbying, uh, which could have resulted in the end of pastoral and mining activities. The co cohesive collaboration of science, agriculture, mining industries and the Lake Eyre Basin community ensured that the nomination did not proceed. Uh, the result for us was that we had to be smarter and betting and better at projecting our historical management strategies and the benefits of this amazing system area to the environment and the clean and green agricultural production methods. As I remember the act at that particular time, the World Heritage Act, it said that grazing was not considered appropriate in the World Heritage Area. That was written into the act. In 1995, I was part of a group of producers who formed the OB Organic Exports, OBE company, to produce and market organic beef in Australia and around the world. The group was formed by producers mostly from the drier parts of the region and the lower part of the rivers, and we were furthest from the markets. For these producers, patchy seasons and high freight costs were negatives on the pr profitability of the business, despite the fact that all the production was of high quality. Um, the group made a decision to go organic and to try and sell less for more. With an established brand and strong regional identity, this has been possible. Uh, our early concerns that supply would exceed demand have not materialised. At the moment, the demand is far outstripping the supply. Certified organic beef and lamb is now an established line in supermarkets and hamburger chains in Australia and around the world with a widening price premium paid to producers. We're using some of our OB, OB organic slides here. Uh, this is not to say that OB is the only company selling organic beef. There are several now uh, uh, selling it, but I've used these for convenience because these are the ones we have, our, our marketing efforts around the world. The company not only markets organic beef to 11 countries throughout the world, but we also market the Channel Country Lake Air Basin region and the people and the towns to the world. Uh, this concept is not new. Um, the wine industry for me has been, the, has, has led me to, to, to market the regions. Um, marketing wines in Australia are backed by highly regarded uh, regional identities uh, like the Hunter Valley, Barossa Valley, Margaret River has been very successful. And I think, I think we can do it here with the Lake Air Basin, the Channel Country, uh, whether we're marketing organic beef, uh, other great beef, lamb, tourism, all, all sorts of things. Uh, if, you've got a good, uh, if you've got a good identity, uh, it makes the job easier. In Australia, there has been a rapid growth in areas certified for organic production. Uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has reported that Queensland is the state with the single most area of certified organic land in the world, along with the highest value of organic agricultural production. This large certified land area is primarily accounted for by large tracts of rangeland organic production in the Queensland Channel Country. Farm gate sales of or from organic beef properties, uh, including cars, reached $72 million in 2012. This represented a 111% rise on the figure of $34 million recorded in 2010. Uh, I look at those figures and I think what it could be like in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, and think that it's a, it's a good bus to be on. Um, in Queensland, uh, the share was sorry, nearly there, five minutes rather. Uh, the Queensland share uh, of that, that uh, production was 69%. Uh, producers within the Lake Air Basin also contribute to the significant value of organic wool production in Australia, which in 2012 reached 25 million, and organic lamb sales 18 million after a 64% rise. Uh, from 2010 to 2012. There are many reasons why uh, consumers choose to purchase organic products, foremost being that they're chemical free and perhaps nutritious and tasty. However, the most pleasing for me as an organic producer is the comment that organics would provide children with their best building blocks for the future. And also the other main comment was a fair price for farmers. 
and uh, I, I agree with both of those. Uh, the Lake Eyre Basin, and in particular the natural river systems, which are distant from intensive agriculture and chemical usage, is an ideal location to foster the growth of organic livestock production. In Australia and around the world, as demand has grown, so have price premiums. As time goes by, it is likely that we'll see clusters of organic production established throughout the region. This will allow branded marketing to be backed by regional identity marketing, which will then flow benefits to tourism as has, helped, has happened elsewhere. And I've really, in the last 15 years since we started the company, I've seen this happening as we talk every year, it's happening. Uh, and I'd like to happen it to the future. So my plea here is that we look well into the future in deciding what is wise use for our Lake Air Basin. The basin already has all the attributes and recognition for it to be a branded hub of clean and green production. My further plea on behalf of uh, downstream and interstate water users is that we do nothing to dam, divert or diminish the volume and the quality of water which flows naturally into Lake Air. My wife Nell here, who's kindly pressing the button on these slides, uh, attended the National Rural Women's Coalition Conference in Canberra last week. Two of the main issues uh, discussed at the conference were the importance of food safety and water safety. The Lake Air Basin is a world leader in both and a living, pulsing, sustainable heart for future generations. Let's keep it this way. Thank you.